702. So we're going to go ahead and get started and, and just go as the Lord leads. Hopefully you have your Bibles uh, handy tonight and peace. Uh, however you take your notes, a couple of things I may ask you to just jot down just so that you will remember them. I want to, before we go into our prayer for this evening, I just want to share a, a, a wonderful praise report. Uh, Y'all remember several weeks ago, we prayed for uh, Priscilla Murphy's new grandson, is Price Lee Black, and uh, who was born with a significant um, birth defect. Well, she, she called me to let me know today that uh, he's two months old, number one, and doing good. And they're getting ready to send him home next All week. Right. Amen. All right. Praise so we just praise God for that. Mm -hmm. She was. She said, "I'm at work, but I'm shouting around in a circle." <laughs> so, That's good. That's good. <laughs> so we just praise God for that. He still has, of course, you know, a, a long road to recovery and full health and to be able to live a, a normal life as a little kid. But we just trust in God to continue the healing process and and to just strengthen his body and let him keep, let him keep fighting. He's really uh, a little fighter and he's just doing so well and gaining weight and all of that. And so we just praise God for answered prayer. Mm -hmm. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, we just come before you with a spirit of thanksgiving for all that you have done. We are so grateful, not only for what you have done, but we praise you for who you are. You're an awesome God and we magnify your name. We thank you for life and for health and for strength. We thank you for protecting us this day from dangers we could see and dangers we couldn't see. We thank you for ordering our steps and leading us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us in ways that we can understand and teaching us and inspiring us to just put our trust in you, to live a life that will bring glory to you, to know that you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask or think. And so we praise you and we give you the glory. We ask that you would just come into this discussion tonight, that you would just move, not according to what I planned, but that it would go according to what you desire for us to hear and to believe and to receive and to understand that we can apply it to our lives, that it will give us strength that we need to live for you in these dark and evil days. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to start, before we go to our text, oh. let me just, because I wanted to begin before we go um, back into our text, I want to begin by exploring the idea of what it means to be used by God. And I would imagine that all of us uh, should want to have the assurance that God is able to use us. We say that all the time. I was thinking about the song that says, use me, Lord. The old song says, use me, Lord. Mm -hmm in thy service. Mm -hmm. I remember some of you all are old enough yeah. to remember that song. Yes, draw me nearer day by day. Yes. Yeah, yeah all right. Me, all all the way. All the way. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think it means when we say I want to be used by God? What is it that? Means, I think yeah. that it, I, that it, I think that it means that there's a, a, a lot of there's a lot of service there's a lot of service out there that uh, needs to be rendered to uh, uh, individuals and in that in rendering that individual that we also that gives us the opportunity to uh, to te to testify about the goodness of, of God you know mm -hmm. and we can do, we and you know we can do that you know I don't I'm not a Bible thumping Karen you know person around but what what and I when I am discussing with uh individual you know I tell you know I tell them you know I, I tell my daughter for instance that that um you she goes mom I'm trying to get it right my older daughter mom I'm trying to get it right and I just go you're not going to get it right until you get back to the church and and, and let God get it right for you so I think that that's what mm -hmm. I think it also means, you know, is to 
be used as an instrument to do the work that God has for us to do. Okay. And so it's, it's, it's different for everybody. Right. And sometimes it's one-on-one. Sometimes it's, it's some whole movement in a community. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, it's, you know, it's just so diverse. You know that it's that it actually becomes really quite personal. Pastor, we that, are the we are the instruments. Mm -hmm. We are on this earth. We are the instruments that God God uses us. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. That's why that's why Scripture refers to us as the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. It right. doesn't mean just that we just gather, but it means that we are His hands. The work that He did when He was on the earth. Now we are commissioned to do. Yes. So we become his feet, his eyes, his ears, his hands, uh, his heart. That's that's we are the the instrument, as, okay. as you said. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's so different. We all are different people. We have different strengths and abilities. We have different opportunities. We have different ways we see the world. But once you step into a relationship with God and you surrender your life to him, it is a life of service. It is a life of being used by God, using your gifts, your talents, your abilities, your, your experiences in a way that will draw others into a closer relationship with God. You become God's representative in many, many, many instances. And to be used by him is such an interesting idea because when we look into it deep, a little deeper, it is, it is not just uh, the Lord told me to talk to the person sitting next to me that I don't know, mm -hmm. okay? And so by faith, I'm gonna come out of my introvert shell and say something, okay? <laughs> now, God will use that moment, absolutely. By faith, you have to do that. But what is happening when that happens, when that, that unction happens, that, that sense that I need to do something or I need to say something or I need to reach out and, and, and help somebody, that little, mm, that little impetus. It, 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 is, it is a concept that, that was popularized in a book that, that is called uh, Experiencing God, The Seven Realities of Experiencing God. And this is by a writer by the name of Blackaby, Richard Blackaby. And what, he's, what he says in this book, which I find so interesting, he says that God is always at work. Yeah. He's always doing something. Mm -hmm. Amen. He's always moving. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> And it's like a stream that's, that's running or like a river that's running. God is always doing. And he says that every so often, he'll come to you, he'll come to me, and he'll say, come on, put your foot in the water and experience what I'm already doing. So when you felt that unction to say something, to do something, to help somebody, yeah. it didn't start with you. It's because God was already doing something mm -hmm. and he wanted you to be a part of what he was doing. Mm -hmm. That's what it means when we talk about being used by God. Mm -hmm. So we don't, so, so we have to free ourselves from thinking that uh, before I, before I said yes and allowed God to use me, nothing was happening. <laughs> and uh, after I'm done, nothing's going to happen after that, because that's not true because God is always moving. And in this, in this book, he says, the reason that God invites you to be a part of what he is already doing is because he has a loving relationship with you. He wants you to experience him in a personal way, you know, and in the simplest things, you know, in the simplest things, sometimes you know, you feel 
uh, just an unction in your spirit or an idea that pops into your head that you should do something. And then, and if you have the faith to go ahead and do it, then you, it opens up and you begin to see, wow, this is deeper than I thought it was going to be. This is more than I thought it was going to be. This is, this is blessing some, I just was trying to give them a dollar. I didn't know it was going to rock that change their whole life, you know, but that's because God set it up and you had the faith to say, yes, he invites you to become a part of his work. And how does he do that? How does he do that? He does that in many ways. You know, sometimes it's through uh, hearing the preach words. Sometimes it's a word of a song. Sometimes it just drops in your spirit and you just feel this, this movement, this like pusher, there's something that comes to you. Sometimes it's somebody else says something to you that lets you know what you should do or what you should believe or what you should try. It comes from many different ways. And so you just got to have your ears open. You got to have your eyes open. You got to pay attention uh, to, to know when it's time. You know, I tried to come up with a, a, a simple analogy uh, that, we, that would explain what I'm talking about. And, and this, is, this is what the Holy Spirit brought to me. If you ever had the experience when you were coming up where, I don't know, maybe your mother or your aunt or father or whoever was in the kitchen cooking dinner while you were outside playing or you were in the other room doing something as a child. And they say, come in here <laughs> and wash these dishes <laughs> so that we can eat. Or they'll say, come in here and stir in this bowl while I'm doing something else. Has anybody ever had an experience similar to that? Okay, so what does that say to me? They were preparing the meal, but at a certain point they invited you to come in and experience what they were already doing. And so you become a part of the process. I know sometimes when we have the grandkids at the house and we're fixing all this food, and they just in there playing video games or whatever. And you say, hey, hey, turn that off and come in here and put the dishes on the table. Okay, or go get the water and put the water, water on the table. Do something. And so what happens then is that they become a part of that process. Mm -hmm. And so when everybody is able to sit down and eat, it's because they have worked with you to make it happen. And it's the same thing that God does. When we say, Lord, just use me. What we're saying is, Lord, I want to be a part of what you are doing. I want to experience what you are doing that's going to be a blessing to somebody else. I'm just a part of it. You just use me. He, he, you know, he, he said, you know, you don't have to use me, but you wanted to use me. Okay. He could do it all by himself. But he uses us to reach out and touch. He uses us to speak to somebody. He uses us to give to something to somebody. He uses us to comfort someone. You know, we sometimes we pray, Lord, you know, send your, send your, send your angels into the hospital and into the jails and <laughs> into the sick room. And, and many times the Lord is saying, I'm sending you. You go. We want to sit at home and let him just send some angels over there. But we are his hands, his feet. We want to be used by him. We become a part of what he is doing. So it's an interesting way of thinking about being used by God. One of the things that, that Blackaby says is that whenever God, you feel God inviting you to be a part of what he's doing, he says it always leads you to a crisis of belief or a crisis of faith because it requires you to do something. And you know, and and I, you know, it's very clear to me because I have some some introvert tendencies, and so even when I feel a strong leading to to say something or to do something, I have to say, okay, you know, come on, Clyde. <laughs> say something and then i mm, then i have to go you so it's a crisis of belief and why is it a crisis of belief because 
You have to decide, am I going to do it? Am I not going to do it? Am I going to trust God or I'm not going to trust God? Am I going to believe that he is actually leading me to do this? Or I'm just going to sit back and say, maybe that wasn't him. So it is a, it always leads you to a crisis of faith. Will I trust God enough to, to just say yes? When we say, I want to be used by him, it requires you to do something to do something, say something, do something, go somewhere. It, it requires action. And so that moment at the crossroads, you have to decide, am I going to do it? I'm not going to do it. I'm going to believe it. I'm not going to believe it. If I want to be used. I want to be used. I have to trust him. I have to believe him. I have to just move out if I really want to be used and experience what he's doing. And one of the final points he says, he says, that if you're going to join God in what he's doing, most of the time, you got to make some adjustments. You got to make some adjustments. You got to shift. You got to do some things that maybe you hadn't thought about doing before. You got to do some things that may make you feel a little uncomfortable. You got to, you know, maybe you're not used to being that open. Maybe you're not used to, you know, sharing your faith at work. Maybe you're not used to, you know, just reaching in your pocket and giving somebody something and you don't even know whether they need it or not. Maybe you're not used to doing those things, but God says it, it, it's going to require that you do something. You got to make some adjustments because being used by him, because it is a walk of faith, it's always uh, put you to the edge. But then he says, I'm right there. I'm right there with you. Yeah. And the final point he makes uh, in experiencing God, and he says this, he says, you come to know God in a deeper way <laughs> when you choose to obey him. Mm -hmm. And when you witness how he is able to accomplish his work through you. So when we said that we are his hands, he's doing the work, but he uses our hands. He's doing the work, but <clears throat> he uses our mouths to speak. You know, that's what that's what's happening when God tells you to say something and it changes the whole atmosphere in the room. Mm -hmm. It's not just the words. It's because God was moving through you, anointing those words. When when you speak to somebody else and they said that those those words that you said changed my life. It woke me up. It gave me some hope. It was not just you. It was because God was speaking, using your voice to do his work. And so when you are obedient to God, you experience him in a deeper way when you see what he is able to do in you and through you that will change the situations and circumstances and the lives that are around you. Whoa, to be used by God. And that's the framework that we're going to be looking through uh, in this final chapter of the book of Ruth, to be used by God. Because we, re we recognize that Boaz as be is being used by God. When we look at the conclusion of this matter, we know that God had an extended story, but he used Boaz and Ruth to be just a little part of that story, because we know that, that Ruth and Boaz are in the lineage of Jesus that began with Abraham and ends 42 generations later with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so they're just, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm giving it away because I'm a preacher about this on Sunday, the Lord say the same, but 42 generations, if a generation is an average between 40 and 50 years, that's like 2000 years. And so just imagine that Ruth and Boaz said yes to the leading of the Holy Spirit. They stepped into the moment of what God had been doing for generations and what God is going to continue to do for, for generations, even down to our lives today. They just stepped in and they experienced God in a more powerful way powerful way. Wow. And the thing is, what this shows me is that, you know, when I, when I look at the state of our world today and, and the state of our, 
our country and our community. It's so easy to be overwhelmed by all of the issues, all of the, the issues of poverty and, and broken families and, and racism and hatred and disrespect and, and fear and uh, everything is being politicized. And it's just, it's sometimes just, it's overwhelming. You know, it's like every day, you know, I woke up this morning and, and first thing on the news is six little girls killed in a bus crash, you know, you know, just woke, woke up yesterday, tornadoes, you know, in Texas, you know, you know, it just every day. And then the, the war in Ukraine, you know, it's just every day. And even looking at the, the, uh, the hearings for the Supreme Court justice nomination and seeing how she's being treated, it's just so much every day can be overwhelming. But the point is that the Bible teaches us that these are, that we would experience these times. These are perilous times. It is, there's not anything unexpected. But the Bible also challenges us to reject any notion that just because we are one person that we can't make a difference. Right. Sometimes you, you, know, you don't want to feel like, well, I'm not the president. I'm not ri rich. I'm not powerful. Mm -hmm. I can't do anything about anything. But the Bible teaches us that one person, he says, as a matter of fact, it says in uh, Joshua 23 and 10, it says, one man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God is he who fights for you and he has promised you. And it doesn't mean literally that one person can be so strong that they can fight off an army of a thousand people. But what it means is that when you say, Lord, use me, he can use you in such an extraordinary way that it will be as though, as, as amazing as, as if one person was fighting an army of a thousand. What God can do in the, through one true believer who is available to be used by him. Because sometimes we feel like we, you, you know, you might not be able to stand here in Colombia and stop the war in Ukraine. Yeah. But you can be a witness to your students who may someday, or to your neighbor, or to the little kid on your street. You can live an example before him because you don't know what that child or that person is destined to become. Someday they may be in the White House. They may have their finger on the button and they may, they may make a different decision because of what you were willing to do when you said, Lord, use me. And I put a poem in here and we just scroll up a little bit, just share this little poem with you and then we're gonna go into our lesson for this evening. And the poem says this, you can see it on your screen. It says, one song can spark a moment. Mm -hmm. One flower can wake a dream. One tree can start a forest. One bird can herald spring. One smile begins a friendship. One hand claps lifts a soul. One star can guide a ship at sea. One word can frame the goal. One vote can change a nation. One sunbeam lights a room. One candle wipes out darkness. Yes. One life will conquer gloom. Mm -hmm. One step must start each journey. One word must start each prayer. Mm -hmm. One hope will raise our spirits. One touch can show you care. One voice can speak with wisdom. One heart can know what is true. One life can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 All right. So now let's go to Ruth chapter four. We'll begin reading at verse nine. Okay. Mm -hmm. And everybody remember where we left off last week? Yep. Okay. With uh, 
Boaz brokering the deal with the other kinsman redeemer mm -hmm. who was actually first in line, but did not want to make the sacrifice. He wanted the land. He wanted to possess the land and add that to his own uh, land. But he did not want to marry Ruth as a part of the deal. So Boaz said, that's what I was hoping for. Okay. I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it. All right, so this is a fairly long passage. So let's, let's just, we're going to read it through to the end, as we always do. And then we're going to go back and begin to unpack it. And then we got, I got a little surprise for you as we, as we go in. Let me just say this up front as a disclaimer. Uh, this approach that we're taking to this, it's going to take us a few weeks, I hope, uh, to get through this. So just hang in there. Uh, uh, we're going to just go as the Spirit leads. Then Boaz said to the elders and to the crowd standing around, you remember he invited all these people to come and be witnesses. And he says, you are witnesses that today I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Milan. Okay? Remember that all of Elimelech, who was the father, all of his property would have gone to his sons, but his sons died. And so there was no one to receive the land. So Boaz is saying, today I am buying this land, okay? And with the land, <laughs> I think this is funny. He said, with the land, <laughs> I have acquired Ruth. <laughs> Ruth come with the land. <laughs> And you notice, we know, we always say they always keep referring to her as the Moabite, okay? But he gives her all, he tells her story right here. He says, so with the land I have acquired Ruth, the Moabite widow of Milan. He acknowledges everything that she has been through. And he says, I am claiming her to be my wife. Amen. And can, can I just put a pen right here? You know, when you enter into a relationship with somebody, it's more than how they look. They bring their whole life with them. You know what I'm saying? It's a, there's a whole person there that has roots and experiences and likes and dislikes and, and hopes and dreams and fears. And you got to be willing to embrace the whole person and take that journey with them. And that's what Boaz is saying. He says, I've acquired Ruth. She's a Moabite. She's a widow. She, had, she was married to another man, but now she's going to be my wife. Amen. And he says, this way, she can have a son to carry on the family name of her dear husband and to inherit the family property here in his hometown. You are all witnesses today. So that's the tradition that I was explaining to uh, uh, David at the beginning. So you see it now, okay? Okay, verse 11. Then the elders and all the people standing in the gate replied, we are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, from whom all the nation of Israel descended. May you prosper in Ephratah and be famous in Bethlehem. What a blessing. Mm -hmm. And may the Lord give you descendants by this young woman who will be like those of your ancestor Perez, the son of Tamar and Judah. So Boaz, so Boaz took Ruth into his home and she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant and she gave birth to a son. Then the women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord, 
who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. For he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast and she cared for him as if he were her own. She loved that grandson. The neighbor women said, now at last, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. Yes. And we know that out of the line of David mm. came Jesus. Yes. yes. That's quite an ending, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> That's quite an ending. So let's look. Let's look at this. Now, one of the things that I find most interesting about this is that when we look at uh, verse 13, which begins with the word so. So Boaz took Ruth, she became his wife. When he went in unto her, as some translations say, or when he slept with her, she became pregnant and she had a son. And they all live happily ever after. But the word so means as a result of everything that has happened before. It's a word that sometimes translated as consequently. So when you say so, it really is a bridge between what's happening now and how it connects to everything that happens before. So we know that even though that, that verse seems so simple, she became his wife, they slept together, she got pregnant, they had a baby, and his name was Obed. But we know that that word so means that that was the result of all of the things that they had been through. They've been on a journey, a journey uh, that was had pitfalls, that had, had death and abandonment and, and famine and poverty and disappointment and depression and, um, and, and fear. But against all of that, Boaz and Ruth found the strength and the courage and the faith to just go as the Lord was leading them and to do whatever he required of them. Mm -hmm. They were willing, as I see it, to be used by God. When, 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 uh, when Ruth promised Naomi that she would go wherever she would go and do whatever, you know, that her God would be her God, her people would be their people. In chapter one, verse 16, uh, Ruth is essentially saying, Lord, use me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to be used mm -hmm. to be a blessing to my mother-in-law. Yes. Okay. She was willing to be used. Boaz was willing to be used. And because they were willing to be used by God, he, he, he manifested his plan in ways that they could never even have imagined. Mm -hmm. And so it makes me wonder, what was it? Let me just say this. Let me just say it this way. Okay. I, one of the things that I, re I really believe is that we are all influenced by the generations that came before us. Let me just put it that way. You know, sometimes I deal with these kids and they act like nothing happened until they, till they popped on the scene, you know? <laughs> you know, they it, you know, because wasn't nothing going on until I got here. Now I'm what's happening, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> but, you know, I always tell them, first of all, that you are, whether you know it or not, you are bits and pieces of all the people, the generation that came before you. You are bits and pieces of every adult 
that ever said anything to you, ever pat you on the back, ever gave you a word of encouragement, ever told you stop that, shut up, sit down, act right, whatever. You are bits and pieces of all those who tell you you can make it, those who told you better do your homework, those who told you come here, boy, hold this hammer, you know, whatever it was, you are bits and pieces of all of them. All of that is inside of you. We are all influenced. And sometimes those influences come out in different ways. It doesn't mean that you act just like them or you make the same choices that you did, that they did, but you are influenced by them in interesting ways. And that's how I see my life, you know? I see my life as, as the result of, is that so, you know? So I am the way I am because of what has happened before. I am who I am because of what has happened before. And so uh, when we look at, at, at Boaz, because we don't know much about Ruth's past. We don't know about her family. We don't know how she came uh, to this place where she was willing to, by faith, step into the stream and experience this great story that God was writing. But we do know something about Boaz's past because the Bible clarifies in Matthew 1 and 5 that Boaz had a mother and his, her, his mother was Rahab. And so if Boaz was willing to make this giant leap of faith to be used by God, to put have this absolute faith in God and, and to trust God, I believe it's because it had something to do with how he was raised, okay? He didn't just pop up out of nowhere. He had an interesting upbringing. And so that's what I wanna do. This is, this is, this is the digression I wanna take. I wanna go back, I want you to go back with me. We're gonna go back to Judges uh, chapter two, I mean, Joshua chapter two. And we want to look at the life and the character of Rahab, Boaz's mom. You know, <laughs> uh, I had a, a cousin of mine who years ago was recording, doing video recordings at our family reunion. And he kept all of those. And then recently he transferred them to DVDs. And when I put mine in and saw my parents, how they were 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when he did the recording and saw my mother as a young, young woman with a flower in her hair who was being flirting with him and being sassy and saw my dad walking across in the background. I mean, it was, it was, I can't even explain to you what it feels like because you see when we're coming up, we don't really, we don't really focus on them. We don't really remember all that. We don't really see all that. But when you, when you can kind of freeze time and go back and see it as an adult, to go back and see how they were when they were your age and younger, it is quite an, an experience. And, and you begin to see why they are the way they are today. And you begin to see remnants of how they were when they were young. And you see that in yourself today. And, and I had never seen it before because I had never had an opportunity to really go back in time and see them as young, young parents. So in many ways, that's what we want to do with Rahab. Go back. We don't know if she's still alive when Boaz marries Ruth or not because the Bible doesn't say but we can go back and look at her and how she was as a, a young woman. And I'm going to, uh, again, this is in Joshua chapter two, beginning at verse one. And we're just gonna read this 
there's quite a bit of this. And so if you just read along, because we're not in a big hurry, we're going to take our time. Now, I want to make sure that everyone knows where we are in Joshua chapter 2. In Joshua chapter 1, in the opening verses, it says, and uh, you can go back and read it for yourself at some point. This is the time when God is raising up a new leader to take the Israelites into the promised land. And you'll recall that when he used Moses as the great deliverer to bring them out of Egypt and take them out of Egypt into the promised land, that when they got there and they looked across the, the Jordan River and they they sent spies over into the promised land and they came back with a report that said, oh, they got giants over there. We can't win. They're going to kill us. They're going to destroy us. They just did refuse to trust God. And so because of that, God said that none of that generation would be able to enter the promised land. And so he sent them back into the wilderness. And for 40 years, they wandered around in the wilderness. Moses died. Everybody on that generation died. Uh, but as they were wandering in the wilderness under God's punishment, he still provided for them. He still provided food. He still provided water. He still provided what they needed, but they all died and their children became adults. And Joshua, Joshua and Caleb were the only ones who had gone of that old generation who had gone into the promised land and said, I believe we can take it. And so because of that, their lives were spared. And so now if Moses is dead, God is speaking to jo Joshua, who is in mourning. He's grieving because Moses is dead. And, and God is saying, I am calling you to step up, you know, step up and lead these people, lead my people into the promised land. So he, Joshua is being raised up to be the leader. And, and the Lord speaks to him. He says, I'm, I'm telling you that everything I promised for Moses, I'm going to manifest through you. Everything that I promised, this generation is going to experience. I promised it to the old generation. They didn't have the faith to pursue it, but I'm raising you up. And I promise you that everywhere your foot steps, I'm going to give you that land. But you got to get across the Jordan to go into that land. And so and several times in Joshua chapter 1, the Lord speaking to him, he says, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, be strong and very courageous until Joshua finally said, okay. And that goes right back to what we were saying before. God had this plan for generations. He's working out this plan. And when he's telling Joshua, be strong and very courageous, what is he saying? He's saying, literally, get up and come on and let me use you. You know, I want you to be a part of this great story of what I'm doing for my people. I want you to experience me in a powerful way. And so what Joshua does, the first order of business is he sends two spies across the Jordan River to go into the city of Jericho. The Jer city of Jericho is a great walled city. The walls are, they excavated the remnants of these walls. And so they have an idea of how tall they were and how wide they were. Um, they were tall enough that there was a whole street on the top of the wall that chariots could go there. People could walk there on top of this wall that they could look out and see the enemy coming across the Jordan River. They could look out in all directions. But the promised land was on the other side of the, Jordan, of the city of Jericho. So the city of Jericho had to be conquered in order to get to the promised land. And so Joshua sends two spies into the city of Jericho. And that's where we begin in Joshua chapter 2. Y'all ready? Here we go. Okay. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River. 
especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. Some of the uh, translations will use the word harlot, but we'll get to that in a moment. But this translation tells it like it is. Rahab, the prostitute. But someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the land. If you would use your imagination for just a moment, as though this was a movie. <laughs> uh, what do we see happening here? These spies entered into uh, the city of Jericho. They were undercover, right? Mm -hmm. They weren't supposed to be seen. No one should have recognized them. No one should have been watching them, but they've been exposed. Somebody saw them. Mm -hmm. Somebody recognized that they were Israelite spies and somebody saw them go to the prostitute's house. And somebody went and told the king. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Told the king, there's some Israelite spies and they've come here to spy out the land. Somebody knew uh, their plan was blown, okay? So <laughs> the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab. Bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. You know, and every time I read that verse, I always say, even the king knew where Rahab's house was. <laughs> mm -hmm. Everybody knew how to get to Rahab's house. All right. All right. Um, her house was built on top of the wall. That lets us know that it was the wall, just how, how amazing and how tall, how big this house, this wall was. Fourth verse, Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. They left town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went, but if you hurry, you can probably catch up with them. So somebody said, She's lying because they are in her house, right? <laughs> but she, I heard somebody say, but she ain't saved yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one time, one time when I, when, I, uh, when I preached about this, I said, what we see here is we see Rahab using a strategy that many women use. And they use it effectively against men because men are so ego driven. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, so when you go ego driven. Oh, okay. Because what, what does she tell them? She says, I don't know where they are, but if you take off running, I believe you can catch them. <laughs> In other words, you know, it's the same thing as which she could have said, but I'm looking at you and you so strong, you so, you so powerful. I believe wherever they went, you gonna find them, but you just got to go running that way. And can't you see those men taking off running to prove to her that they could catch them? Because that's what we do. <laughs> that's what we do. You know, my pastor, what we say, do. My pastor used to say, you know, the male ego is like a balloon. And the woman, the women, the wise woman knows how to blow it up and tie a string on it. <laughs> she can lead, lead you around by, like by a string. <laughs> All right, I'm just laughing at myself. Okay. You know. <laughs> but when we look at that, we can see, we can see that we had to, we have to assume that Rahab knew how to deal with men. Because that was her mm -hmm. profession. She knew how to deal with men. She knew how to do with the male ego, okay? And that's why she doesn't mind lying. And she didn't mind telling them 
you know, you just go on, you know, you can probably catch up with them in verse five. And they took off running. Verse six, she actually, actually what really happened was uh, she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath bundles of flax she had laid out. We'll talk about that too. So the king's men, see there, what did they do? Took off. You see, they, they went looking for, the <laughs> yeah. looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. So not only did she get rid of them, but they got locked out <laughs> of the city. They couldn't come back to the next day. All right. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk to them. This is what she says. She says, I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. That was their parents' generation. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And we know yeah. what you did to Sion and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens, above and the earth below. Now she brokers the deal. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me a guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all their families. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety. The men agree. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us this land. Then, since Rahab's house was built on the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. Now, this suggests that her house was built on the wall but she had an exterior window that you could climb out of and you would be outside the wall, okay? Mm -hmm. Escape to the hill country, she told them. Hide there for three days from the men searching for you. Then when they have returned, you can go on your way. Before they left, the men told her, we will be bound by the oath we have taken only if you follow these instructions. When we come into the land, you must leave this scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you have let us down. And all your family members, your father, your mother, brothers, and all your relatives must be here inside the house. Mm -hmm. And if they go out into the street and are killed, it will not be our fault. Mm -hmm. But if anyone lays a hand on people inside this house, we will accept responsibility for their death. If you betray us, however, we are not bound by this oath in any way. That's just part one of the story. And then she says in verse 21, she says, I accept your terms. Mm -hmm. And she sent them on their way leaving the scarlet rope hanging in the window. Mm -hmm. The scarlet rope hanging in the window makes you want to know, well, wonder what's going to happen, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. so, all right. So let's, let's, let's look at this. Let's look and see what we can understand uh, about what's happening here. Okay. When we go back to the beginning, we talk about being used by God. We find that even in this story that God is doing some 
unexpected things. Let me, let me just say, let me just let me just say one point, and then we will we will we will end, and we'll pick up here next week. Okay. All right. Joshua sent the spies into the promised land because he wanted to gather information. That's all. He wanted to get the information and bring it back. But what the scripture reveals is that, that God uh, didn't have just an immediate plan that, that would require the gathering of the information. God had an amazing plan. Because one of the things we know is that, is that God was going to require them not to to fight, to destroy the walls of Jericho, but to walk in obedience around the walls of Jericho for seven days. Mm -hmm. And then on the seventh day to do it seven times, to blow the trumpets of praise. There was an order, there was a commandment. It was the one thing that, well, there was no way they could have destroyed the walls of Jericho on their own, but God was setting it up. But in order for that to happen, it was important for them to be their faith to be inspired, to be stimulated. Because as I said before, when God invites you to be a part of what he's doing, it always leads you to a crisis of faith. He wants to do something extraordinary. All right. So is it possible? So not to fault Joshua for not having enough faith to just walk up on in there and, and do it, but he was being sensitive to the leading of the spirit. So is it possible that these two spies were sent into the city of Jericho so that you and I would know that if we're willing and obedient to let God work out his plan, he will order our steps even when we don't know where we're going. Amen. Because we know that it's God's plan for them, for them to end up at Rahab's house, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that the Lord inspired Joshua to send these spies, not just to spy out the land, but to let us know that God can use anybody? All right. He wants to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anytime. Mm -hmm. Anywhere. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Is it possible that these two men were chosen to go into Jericho so that we could be able to see that although problems, because they didn't expect to be exposed or called out, that was unexpected. But it lets us know that even when problems rise unexpectedly, nothing is ever unexpected with God. Amen. It seems it surprises Amen. us, but it does not surprise God. Why? Because he is always moving. Yes. He's preparing. He's yes. shifting. He's taking yes. down. He's setting up. He's moving people in and moving people out. He's doing all kinds of things. And all he says is just, will you trust me enough oh, yes. to oh, just yeah. step into the plan mm -hmm. of what I'm already doing? Oh, all right. That's the, final, that's the final point Amen. for tonight. Yes. Uh, we're going to keep digging deeper. Mm -hmm. So come back next week. Next week. <laughs> to be continued. Same, same time, same, same station. Time. That's right. That the scarlet <laughs> rope will be hanging in the window. <laughs> <laughs> All right. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. We're out of time. That time just got away from me. I'm yeah, sorry. We're so quick. Yeah. Yeah. Good lesson. But we're going to dig. Good we're going to dig deep and talk about Boaz's mama. Find out why Boaz is Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this gathering of your children. We thank you, Lord, for what you're teaching us and how you're challenging us to put our trust in you. Oh, yeah. We are grateful that you would use uh, imperfect people like us yes. to, yeah. to experience your perfect work. Oh, yeah. yes. You would take us with all of our faults and flaws and weaknesses and insecurity oh, yeah. and then anoint us so that we yes. can experience what you, what you are able to do oh, through yeah. us and in us. We give you the glory. Yes. We thank you for your faithfulness. Um, 
to us individually mm -hmm. and through the work of ministry that you place into our hands mm -hmm. and for how you cover our church. We can see it with our eyes. We can hear it with our ears that we are blessed among many. Oh, yes. We, we praise your name. Yes, we ask sir. that you would protect those who are gathered here and those that we love. Please. Bring us back together at the appointed time. In Jesus' yes. name, amen. Jesus' name, amen. 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 Travel safe. All right. To be continued. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.